All right. Welcome to Corporate Junkie. I am your host, Corp J. And thank you for joining me. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the channel that gives you a different spin on trending topics. I do have a very great topic for you all today. We're going to be discussing why countries like Ghana find the success of Afrobeats through Nigerian artists problematic. Now, they shouldn't, but for some reason they do. So I'm going to tell you why that is. Now, before I do all of that, I want to give you the history of Afrobeats. So in this video, I'm going to give you a brief history of the origin of Afrobeat, the founder of Afrobeat. And then I'm also going to uh, draw a comparison with another music genre that revolutionized our world, that revolutionized music, that took the entire music industry by storm. I'm talking about hip hop. I'm going to talk to you about the similarities and how hip hop also began just like Afrobeat began years ago. And then I'm going to tell you the opportunities for Afrobeat, where Afrobeat is going. I'm going to tell you what lies ahead. I'm going to tell you all of that that's coming to Afrobeat. And then I'm going to tell you why this is a problem for people, for countries like Ghana and every other country that somehow are hating on the success of Nigerian artists. Bruh. And then we're going to talk about uh, Burner Boy. We'll talk about the success and what's going on with Burner Boy. And I'm going to wrap this video up. So let's get into this because I have a lot to cover. So let's talk about this. All right. So Afrobeat, which is a genre, I'm talking about Afrobeat without the S, just Afrobeat, is a music genre. And what is the genre? What is a music genre? So according to uh, Wikipedia, Music genre is a conventional category that identifies some places of music as belonging to a shared tradition or a set of convention. Now, a shared tradition, what is that? Normally, a tradition is something that is shared with a, a culture. That's where you would find a shared tradition, something that has a culture. Now, what is a culture? How we determine culture is through five factors that I that I use to determine culture. This is what most people use to determine what a culture is. Those five factors are a culture determined by language, determined by belief, determined by clothing, determined by food, and last but not the least, music. These are five factors that determine a culture. And you're going to find that this also is what represents Afrobeats and Afrobeats comes from a particular culture that exemplifies these five factors. But before we even do all of that, let's talk about the other genre, um, hip hop. Let's talk about hip hop, the history of hip hop. And I'm gonna tell you how that relates to Afrobeat, and I'm gonna tell you what lies ahead for Afrobeat, just like hip hop. Now hip hop was born out of necessity was founded in August, on August 11th, 1973, on Cedric Avenue, West Bronx, New York. Hip hop was founded by uh, a Jamaican national known as DJ Cool Herc, whose real name was Clive Campbell. Uh, DJ Cool Herc uh, migrated to the Bronx, to New York, to the United States, from Kingston, Jamaica, where he was born. He migrated with his family in 1967. He and many others like him were beneficiaries of a new immigration law that had just been passed the years prior. In 1965, uh, President Lyndon Johnson passed uh, the Immigration and Naturalization Act, which allowed people like him, people like DJ Cool Herc, many other Jamaican nationals, as well as Puerto Ricans and Haitians and Africans to come to the United States. So a lot of uh, this period of time, a lot of migrants from these countries really flooded into the United States and uh, you know, made their way primarily to New York, 
uh, Connecticut, New Jersey. This is where they primarily resided. It's important to understand that, which is why hip hop early day, early in the early days had a lot of uh, Jamaican artists and a lot of Jamaican sound in the early stage. Um, so there were a lot of Jamaican background artists that emerged from hip hop. People like uh, Eddie Grant, uh, Electric Avenue, um, you know, um, Heavy D, uh, Busta Rhymes, and the most famous of all, uh, Notorious B.I.G. So the year is 1973, and hip hop was emerging. It started in an apartment of um, DJ Cool Herc. His apartment when he turned 18. Uh, he had his 18th birthday um, in in the Bronx, where he invited people and had a couple of turntables, which he experimented with to create sound and beats. Now understand that DJ Cool Herc came from. Uh, uh, from a background of music. His father also was in a band. So he was familiar with sound and was familiar with music, but he wanted to do something different from what his father was doing in Jamaica and also when he came to the United States was doing. So, so in his apartment, his first birthday party is where it was recorded that hip-hop was giving birth to that moment. It now went from an apartment to the streets of New York, uh, South Bronx, Harlem, New Jersey, where kids were now expressing themselves through break dancing. They were now using also graffitis to express themselves. So hip hop was nothing but just tunes and beats from a turntable and break dancing. And that became a sensation that even people in the UK, in London, began to emulate. So the Convent Garden in London began to really emulate break dancing and form their own site sound because of what was going on in the United States. Not long after that, the first hip hop album was released by a group in New Jersey. The hip hop album was called Rapper's Delight in 1979, which, now, which gave way to a lot of artists that followed afterwards. And so Rapper's Delight uh, became a groundbreaking um, rap song by a group that really paved the way for other artists. So other artists at this point now began to really utilize hip hop as a way of expression. And so other artists like Eddie Grant from Jamaica, as well as Kumo D, uh, Curtis Blow, um, Cool and the Gang, these artists started to emerge in their early and late 70s, early 80s. And that was what hip hop stood for at that time. So we started to see hip hop move into a political type of expression. We started to see music used as a political stance to discuss and talk about what was going on with black people during that time. So big hits and hits like The Message by Grandmaster Flash and The Furious Five became a huge hit and also paid in full by uh, Eric B. and Rakim. These songs began to be the engine where people were using to really voice what was going on in their surroundings. Understand that during this period in time, we're talking about the 70s now, okay? Black people had just come out of, uh, this was post-Civil Rights era, okay? Civil Rights Act had just been passed in 1965. Black people were still going through a heavy, intense racial discrimination in this country. This country was just reeling from a long um, 100 years of Jim Crow law that existed in this country. Jim Crow laws ended in this country in 1968, as well as great migration had just occurred in this country where blacks, because of the Jim Crow, that they suffered the Jim Crow laws they suffered in the South, blacks migrated to the North. So a heavy concentration of blacks were in the North, New York, Boston, Connecticut. This is where we're talking about New Jersey. So in, in the mid-70s, black people began to use hip-hop as a way to voice their, their displeasure uh, and their opinion and also uh, to voice what was going on in the community. Now, obviously, this angered the white communities who used uh, a lot of anger and police to really push back at this newfound music. And they called it trash. A lot of execs back then, when they saw this coming up, even the execs from Atlantic Records and Capitol Records thought this was a fad that was not going to take hold and will not be anything. 
So there was all this effort to try to shut this down. But then more artists began to emerge. Public Enemy began to speak against these things. Uh, Ice Cube began to really speak against all of these. These were things that were happening in the, uh, in the 70s and in the 80s. So these artists began to become political activists. Hip-hop was the voice of the community. And later on in the late 80s, we began to see, late 80s all the way to the 90s, uh, we began to see a new set of uh, artists that wanted to take hip-hop from just a political uh, tool to now a mainstream era. They wanted to compete with the likes of Beastie Boys. Michael Jackson at this point was a huge phenomenon. He had also been able to bridge um, you know, the uh, mainstream media and hip-hop wanted to become something that could also uh, follow suit and become a fo voice and a force to reckon with. So new artists like Tupac started to emerge, Notorious B.I.G., Puff Daddy, uh, MC Hammer in the 80s, um, MC, uh, MC Light in the 80s, as well as in the 90s. You have also like Missy Elliott, uh, LL Cool J, who emerged in the 80s, all the way into the 90s. These artists began, began to become mainstream. Uh, Nas, Jay-Z, and so on and so forth. They took hip-hop from a political stance to mainstream. So at this period in time of 90s, people started, the walls started to break down. And this is what hip-hop did. Break the barriers that had, plagued, that had plagued this country for years. So a lot of white artists started to collaborate with a lot of the hip-hop artists. So Madonna, um, you know, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, uh, Justin Timberlake, all of these artists began to collaborate with black artists. And for the first time in history, black people really began to intermingle in a way that was, that was a beautiful thing to see. This was occurring during that period in time. Now the hip-hop hip now began to become even much more larger than anyone could have predicted. That movies were now becoming something that hip-hop artists uh, were making and movies started to reflect hip-hop. Hip-hop started to influence movies. So we saw hits like, um, you know, Juice, Boys in the Hood, Minutes to Society, um, Friday, Do the Right Thing. These movies emerged because of hip-hop. Hip-hop had an influence in, influence in these movies. The culture of hip-hop began to tell people, trying to show us how to dress, what to think, what to drink. Hip-hop was now becoming something that they used as advertisers and companies began to use hip-hop as a way to express and sell a lot of products. And then these artists wanted to take their own um, destination by storm. And so they decided that they were not just going to begin, they were not going to allow big brands to sell themselves or, or promote them. They wanted to become their own uh, producers as well as designers and whole and really kind of uh, take control of their destinies. They wanted to uh, express themselves much more than what they've been doing. So they wanted to take their own destinies in their own hand. And so at this period, we now see hip hop going into the clothing line. Many of these artists now wanted to be their own designers. They wanted to design their own clothes. They wanted to really take their own destiny in their own hands. So the late 90s, early 2000 was where we saw the emergence of clothing lines uh, from a lot of these artists. So clothing lines like Fat Farm by Russell Simmons, um, Sean John by Sean Puffy Comb, P. Diddy, Rock Aware by Jay-Z and Demon Dash, uh, Fubu by Demon John, uh, and Nietzsche, um, you know, Carl Kanai, State Property uh, by Benny Siegel, all of these brands started to emerge uh, by, at the hands of rappers and hip-hop artists. Now, I would know because I was right in the middle of all of that. <laughs> I was in the middle of all that. I was part of the team back in New York in the 2003, 2004, 2005, all the way to the Great Recession that occurred in 2008. I was part of the team that held fashion shows for Fashion Week in New York twice a year, in February and in September at uh, Bryant Park. Uh, this is when they had it at Bryant Park. Now it's held at Lincoln Center. This is when, before it was moved to Lincoln Center in 2011. I was part of the team that really helped. So I really was in the midst of all of that to see. It was a very fascinating to see 
these artists and these rappers now become entrepreneurs in their own right and really kind of paved the way for streetwear clothing lines and all of that. Now, a lot of these clothing companies are uh, still around, but they're not as, uh, they don't, they've lost their magic and not as popular as they used to be because hip hop has evolved to something totally different. And that was a, f f uh, a great thing to see. I would even tell you that hip hop and the power of hip hop paved the way for the election of the first black president of the United States, Barack Obama. If it weren't for hip hop doing that, I don't think Barack Obama would have been elected United States president. Because think about it, at this point when he, when Senator Obama even dared to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to run for election, uh, black and white had now become intermingled uh, because of hip hop. There was a lot of inter interrelationship going on. A lot of walls have been broken down. So people now began to see black people as equal to themselves other than the color of their skin. Not to, not to uh, diminish the point that racism existed still and is still existing today, but it was a lot better than what we were in the 60s and the 70s. And so that's what hip hop did. Hip hop paved the way for Barack Obama to be president of the United States and hip hop did phenomenal did a lot of great things and revolutionized the United States, also touched people outside of this country, as well as many in Africa learned about black community and black culture because of hip hop. I'm going somewhere with this, so stick with me. Now, unfortunately, hip hop lost its magic and hip hop fell off along the way. And here are three things, in my opinion, that really caused the demise of hip hop to occur. Number one, the use of the N word which to me is a dishonor to the legacy of black people, people that died uh, when that word was used, people that were lynched, people that were dehumanized. And the last thing they heard was the N-word before they were killed. The use of that in their music, in their song, and also allowing others who are not black to use that with impunity, to me, is a disgrace and a shame to the community. I believe that the ancestors are crying out in the grave and have cursed hip hop and everyone that profited from the use of that word, which is why we've seen the destruction of those who were rappers and we've seen the end of those people. So if you watch all artists, many of the hip hop artists, and look at their lifestyle and where they ended, don't take my word for it, just take a look at that, you will see the hand of the ancestors cursing those that have ever profited by using the N-word in their music. I don't care what excuses they give. That is a shame. The second thing I will tell you is a shame is the promotion of crime and the glamorization of gangster living uh, to me is also something that caused the demise of hip-hop. And lastly, thirdly, I will say the, uh, the denigration of the community the same communities that early on they will use hip hop to voice to try to get the attention of the government to look at their condition. Deny the denigration of those communities as well as their women in their songs to sell record to me is also another reason why hip hop fell off. Now this is something that I would say that Afrobeat artists would need to pay attention to. Do not, do not dishonor the memories of your ancestors. Do not dishonor the memories of the ancestors in this country by utilizing the N-word in your music. And I know I've seen Bonner Boy do this in the past. My advice to him would be for him to stop doing that. Otherwise, he is, and many others, if they do that, are going to suffer the same faith as a lot of these hip-hop artists. Let's talk about Afrobeats. Now, Afrobeats, like hip-hop, started in the 70s. Um, Afrobeat is the brainchild and the founder of Afrobeat was Fela Kuti, who is a Nigerian. And in 1970, 1971, 72, Afrobeat was born. But before all of that, Fela in 1957, a uh, young Fela decided to study music in London, at the, uh, the London School of Music, where he uh, wanted to learn the arts of music, instrument, and while he was in London, he discovered jazz at that time. And jazz was 
a phenomenon, a thing, and was fascinated with jazz. He was fascinated with that. So, so fella at that time would skip class and go and hang out with a lot of jazz singers and go to clubs and really try to immerse himself in that whole thing. He learned about James Brown, and that was something that really inspired him. Fella, right, fella did not uh, finish his course at the London School of Music. He returned home because he was so excited about this, uh, really starting his own music, utilizing the whole jazz sound. In 1963, he returned back home to a young Nigeria, which had, who had just uh, gained the independence a couple of years prior. Fela firsthand noticed the corruption uh, that was now taking place, that was eating out uh, young Nigeria at that time. And this corruption really led to a three-year civil war that ravaged a huge part of Nigeria. This war ravaged and, and dislocated a lot of uh, people in the east, in the south-south and southeast part of Nigeria. It was so bad that uh, even the Times recorded this. This war lasted from 1967 to 1970. Uh, this, was also, this was also what inspired him to create his band, which he went to around Nigeria playing and also went to Ghana to play his music during that period in time. Now, this is the same time that a lot of Ghanaians will tell you that because Fela came to their country to, to play, they used that as a way to say that Fela... Uh, Afrobeat was created in, in Ghana. That is not factually true. That is factually incorrect. So you'll find people on the internet utilizing that. That is incorrect. Fela created Afrobeat in Nigeria, but went around the continent of Africa playing his song. That is factually documented. In 1969, Fela also decided to uh, visit the United States, um, where he met a young lady named Sandra Isidore who profoundly had an impact on Fela during that period in time. This was in 1969, a year after Martin Luther King had been assassinated. The Baltimore riot had just taken place. And Sandra, who was an activist, who she was an ex-Black Panther activist, she was also a singer, uh, took to Fela, and they both fell in love. If you believe that Fela can ever be in love with one woman. Um, but during that period in time, she showed Fela all of the works of the civil rights leader that existed during that time. I'm talking about civil rights leaders like uh, Markham X, Martha Luther King, who had just been assassinated, uh, Angela Davis, Jesse Jackson, and many others who fought for the civil rights acts that was passed in this country. Fela was very inspired by that. And so when he returned home uh, in around 1971, he was then now able to build his own music genre, which we know today as Afrobeat. So that is the story of Afrobeat. That is what is factually documented as Afrobeat. Afrobeat is a, a blend of Yoruba music, as well as Fuji, as well as jazz, as well as funk, as well as high life, all blended together to make what we know today as a music genre, Afrobeat. Now, Afrobeat over the years, in the, in the mid-70s, will become its sound uh, utilizing a lot of Fuji and a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, blend of that um, to really create music. So artists, early artists started to emerge. Uh, classic artists like uh, Sonia Day, King Sonia Day, began to really emerge. Oye Kawenu, uh, Majek Freshek, who is known to be the Nigerian Rastafarian with his hits, Send Down the Rain. Um, Lagbaja, the faceless man, the man without a face. These artists began to really emerge uh, back in the days, in the 80s. You'd be hard-pressed to go to anywhere in Nigeria during those times, in any parties, and not find uh, Sonia Day played. I remember as a kid, back in those days, my parents would demand when, when they took when they went to parties and I was just a little kid, that uh, Sonia Day be played. They would, they would play it all over. It classic hits. Oye Kawenu, these were songs, great hits that were played back in the days. And these were sounds of uh, what was created by Fela and the tone and the style of Afrobeat. Fast forward to the 90s, just like uh, hip hop, other artists started to emerge. 
And then in the early 2000s, we find the artists like Two Phase, uh, DeBange, uh, P Square. These artists, the new time artists, started to really kind of form the roots that paved the way, as well as all the other new artists that we're finding now that called the 2010 artists. Uh, the uh, uh, Burner Boy, the DeVito, the West Kid, uh, the Tiwa Savage, Ron Town, uh, Kiss Daniel, uh, Techno. These are the new artists that we all know today. But all of these artists, whatever sound they have, which are coined Afro beats today, understand that those sounds and those flavor are all under the umbrella of Afro beat, which is created by a Nigerian, Felakuti. So Afro beat is a genre. Afro beats is not a genre, and that's Afro beats with the S. That is just something that was created by a bunch of uh, guys in London to create some kind of uh, uh, confusion. So whether it's Afro beats, whether it's Afro fusion, whether it's Afro pop, all of these are under the umbrella of Afro beat, which is a Nigerian creation. So here are the opportunities for Afrobeat in the future. Just like hip hop, Afrobeat is going to revolutionize the entire globe. We're going to begin seeing Afrobeat represented in movies. We're going to start seeing uh, great production movies where those artists represented in and the music represented those songs. It's going to be something that's going to take Nigeria and Africa and the entire world. We're starting to see, you know, um, Afrobeat, the, the, the latest collection of Jordan, is all, it was represented, uh, was inspired by Afrobeat, the latest shoe collection of Jordan. Uh, we're going to now also see designers and clothing designers and clothing um, collections created um, with the inspiration of Afrobeat, just like hip hop. These are going to be the opportunities that we're going to see because of Afrobeat. It is even going to be bigger, I think, than what hip hop uh, was. Reasons why is because when you think of the population and the spirit of Nigeria, over more than 60% of Nigerians are entrepreneurs, which is a larger number, a much larger number than that of blacks in this country. And so when you, when you add that to resilience, you're going to get a phenomenon that's going to transform the globe. So Afrobeat is, uh, it's time. This is its moment to shine. It's this moment to really kind of take Africa. I believe Nigeria is the stone that was rejected by the builder that has now become the cornerstone. I believe Nigeria is going to really take the entire world and is going to lead black people in the continent, black people here in the diaspora. I believe Nigeria, through music, is going to transform government, politics, social construct in the entire continent. And so this is why I believe that countries like Ghana find this to be a problem because they perhaps have seen what lies ahead with Afrobeat. And my advice to Ghana would be to fall in line to support Afrobeat because a success for Nigeria is a success for the entire continent. You either support it or get the hell out of the way. Because this train is not going to be stopped. It is taken off and the whole world and history will bear record. History bears record that the, creator, the creators of Afrobeat are Nigerians. And that's what history bears record. And that's a factually correct thing. So that is the story of Afrobeat. And that is the future of Afrobeat. So let's talk about Burner Boy. So Burner Boy has been experiencing a tremendous success with his music. Uh, with his latest album, sixth album that was just dropped called Love the Mini, has been really trending and gaining a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, has been charted. And um, he's got great hits like, uh, like Last Last in the album, For My Hand with his collaboration with Ed Sheeran, as well as Vanilla. These hits are all included in the album and has been really doing phenomenally well. And I'm so excited to see Burner Boy represent the spirit of Fela and represent the spirit of Afrobeat in its truest form. And I continue to hope that he, he will continue to do that. Burner Boy was also featured in April. It was the first African artist 
featured on Billboard's uh, cover page magazine. And that is a huge accomplishment. And through, uh, with the help of Nigerian artists, uh, Afrobeat has now become a category, a search category on all streaming platforms. So these artists are paving the way for Africa. And they're doing it with style and grace and doing it with originality and doing it with such authenticity. And that is why a lot of people are in love with them and a lot of people are falling in love with Afrobeats and falling in love with these Nigerian artists. I can only tell you that this is going to be greater than what anyone can imagine. And so countries like Ghana can either be part of history by collaborating with these artists, just like many others collaborated with hip hop to make hip hop a big thing and are now seared in history. They can either do that or they can be left on the side of the way. So all right, that's my video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please give it a thumbs up. Also subscribe to the channel. If you sing in Ananda, so can store her by my side, oh why? Set the two up for the four me or the for the baby. For them, hey, y'all, this, y'all, this. Don't be your bother on the roads. Men do effect of only. But they are legged on me, too. You will hard, they hard, they hard. If I may share my safety, they can only, baby. Oh, you come here, I'll